All right, well, we're continuing through Luke's gospel, and of course, we're tracing the steps of our Lord Jesus, seeing what his life is all about, seeing what those who followed him were doing, what it is he was calling them to do. We're seeing people trained. We're seeing people raised up and sent out. We're seeing the the movement um, basically growing, and we know it doesn't stop there. It eventually does reach large portions of the earth. I mean, think about where we're at right now. And uh, let's also think about the places that, yet, that haven't yet been reached that our Lord would have us to work towards reaching. All right, so Luke chapter 10, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 16. Let me just say in advance that there is a lot that is here, but much of this ground we've covered before, so I'm only going to deal with, you know, in, in detail or any detail, those parts that are unique to this. Okay, so beginning in verse 1. Now, after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. And he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go, behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves, carry no money belts, no bag, no shoes. And greet no one on the way. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him, but if not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking what they give you, for the labor is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is set before you, and heal those in it who are sick, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your city which clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the, in the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will be brought down to Hades. The one who listens to you listens to me, and the one who rejects you rejects me. And he, rejects, uh, he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. Well, as I've said, there's a lot here. So uh, let's go ahead and get into it, and we'll see what we, we can see. So very quickly, by way of reminder, because this is leading up into what we're seeing right now. Last week, Jesus challenged those who were following him to see if they had what it takes to be his disciple, whether they had counted the cost. Remember, it's, it wasn't going to be easy to follow Jesus, nor were they going to get very much, really, of what the world had to offer if, if they did. Jesus said even the animals had more than he did. At least they had a place to call home. If you follow me, Jesus is saying, the same would be true for you. You, you would not have, have even a place to lay your head. Now, again, that's because of the time. It's not exactly the same today, but there are still things we have to give up. He challenged them whether or not they would make him and his kingdom a priority when it came to following him or doing something else, even something which was a duty. Were they willing to put him first, leaving the other things to those who could do them just, just as well? And he challenged them as to whether they would serve him or whether they could serve him with their whole heart if they could let go of what was behind and keep looking ahead. Well, basically, Jesus was, you know, putting that fork, as it were, into the grain that had been harvested, and he was winnowing, getting rid of the chaff, seeing if there was any wheat, any wheat he could use. And now, having done that, he calls the wheat, or he calls those who were qualified to put their hand to the plow and to begin the work. This morning, I want us from this text to consider three things. And the first one is essentially sort of a catch-all um, point that encompasses a lot of what we've seen because we really want to focus on the last two and really the last one. The first one is the 70 are sent out. Second one is the offer of peace. 
And the third one is the danger of rejection. So first of all, let's look at the 70 sent out and some of the instructions that are here. Now remember in chapter 9 at the very beginning, Jesus sent out the 12, and now he's able to send out 70. And from this we see that the kingdom was progressing, right? More had counted the cost and considered the kingdom worth it and had made it their priority. Their hearts were in it. And so Jesus takes them and he sends them into the harvest. And let me just again mention that this is really the goal that Jesus has for us. This should be our personal goal, to devote ourselves to his cause in this way, to have a single heart, a single mind that's united basically for his glory. You know, when you have a single purpose, that means that it overrides everything else. This is what you want. This is what you desire. Uh, we need to become more like Jesus because that's exactly what he was like. And the more we are like him, the more usable we will be to the Lord. It isn't until we're usable that he will send us out. Now, another thing that's interesting that some commentators have pointed out here is that, you know, just the imagery that, that is presented here and the numbers, you know how numbers are often significant symbolically in the Bible. Uh, they, <clears throat> they see here the New Testament church essentially being formed out of the Old Testament church because notice the parallels that already exist here. The Old Testament church was built upon 12 patriarchs, right? The, the 12 sons of Jacob. But the New Testament church has its 12 apostles. Jesus has already appointed them. Again, notice the, the imagery and the parallelism. Here we see the Lord um, raising up 70 and sending them out. Is there any significance to that? Well, you know, in the Old Testament, when Moses was looking at all the work that he had to do and judging the people and how he was wearying the people, the Lord said to him, Moses, I want to appoint 70 elders to help you do your work of judging Israel. Okay? Well, here the Lord calls 70 men to help Jesus, who is really the second Moses. Remember how Moses said, the Lord is going to raise up a prophet like me. Here's one who is prophet, priest, and king, and he's got this ministry, right? It's a huge ministry. He's going to winter the people through the word of God. Well, the Lord gives him, his father gives him 70 more men to help him in this work, to go out and preach a message. And it's interesting that that message is actually what the Lord was going to use to judge Israel. Jesus says in John 12, verse 48, when he's speaking to those who were rejecting him, he who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. You see, that word is essentially a judge. If you receive it, you're saved, right? If you don't receive it, it will judge you. And by the way, that judgment will be very severe. And that's what we're going to look at towards the end. So the New Testament church was essentially being formed out of the Old Testament people of God. And soon, of course, would include the Gentiles as well. Uh, the church is growing. You know, this was the day of Christ's popularity. This was a day of great things. This is the kind of day that we're looking for and praying for and hoping for. Now, Jesus sent them out in pairs. And he did that so that they might have each other's support. No man is an island. We can't live the Christian life by ourselves, right? Solomon writes this in Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 through 10. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift his, up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. You know, it just occurs to me that realizing that this is true when we see people who are professing faith, particularly if they happen to be members of the congregation, isolating themselves by themselves, they're the ones who are in the most danger, right? They're falling and there's nobody to lift them up. But we're supposed to be lifting them up, right? That's our obligation. That's our responsibility. That, that's our privilege as members of the same body. We do need to remember the Lord does not intend for us to live the Christian life or to do this work by ourselves. That's the reason why he put us together as a body and gave us the particular gifts that he has given to us uh, so that we can serve one another so that we can help equip one another and encourage one another and lift one another up when we fall. Now, Jesus wanted to make sure they had that support, right? We need that support as well, and we need to be a support to members of 
the body. Jesus sent them ahead, Luke 10, 1, to every city and place where he himself was going. Notice he's sending them forward basically as heralds to test the soil, okay? If they were received, then Jesus would know when he went to that city, he would be received. If they weren't received, neither would he be. And I, I'd venture to say if they weren't received, I doubt that Jesus actually went to that particular village. But Jesus also sent them to break ground, right? To break ground. Breaking ground is important. To prepare the people to receive him. I mean, isn't that exactly what John the Baptist did for Jesus when he was preparing the people of Israel for the coming of the Messiah? Jesus now is sending his disciples out to get the cities ready to receive him. And they were to do this through acts of mercy, by healing, and by preaching the word. By the way, I should mention just um, at Trinity PCA, years ago we had a, a method of evangelism that we were uh, using. It wasn't... Um, Evangelism Explosion, the D. James Kennedy was a, I forget what it was called exactly, but um, the, the principle behind it was we go into the neighborhood, knock on doors, try to break ground, try to get people to answer the door, try to introduce ourselves, tell them where we're from, why we're there, not bait and switch, you know, not trying to hide anything, but just tell them why we're there, like to tell them about Jesus, and if they let us do that, we would tell them, okay, we'd give them some information, we'd ask them if we could come back and we we would then keep coming back if the Lord opened the door and little by little give them the picture. So essentially, uh, we were trying to break ground, then we were trying to plant some seed, and then we were trying to water that seed, and all the time praying and, and hoping that the Lord might use that to save them. You know, we do need to under realize, I think, that the Lord doesn't often save whoever he saves. The first time they hear the gospel. Some people are saved the first time they hear it, but most people are not. Most people need to hear the gospel many, many times. I think somebody did a poll and found the average was like around 20, 20 times before they receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Some, of course, don't receive it at all, but those who do, they have to hear it many times, and that may likely have been the case with some of us here. And that reminds us that there is a process, and because there's a process, we need to make sure that we don't give up on anyone too quickly. If you just broke ground, don't expect the person necessarily to come to faith. Don't just give up on them, but continue to go back and do what you can to bring the gospel to them. By the way, I think developing a relationship with them is very helpful before you try to do that. You might say that's breaking the ground as well. Now, Jesus also told them to pray for more workers. Seventy were ready to be sent out, but he says there were still more who were needed because the work was too great. He says in verse 2, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Now, we look around us and we don't necessarily see the, the need for more workers here because, um, you know, we just assume people aren't going to be responsive. We shouldn't assume that. We should assume the Lord's still going to work. He's still going to call his people. We need more people out here. But think about what David Robbins told us when he was here sharing about what's going on in Uganda, how we need to pray for them, how they need more workers, especially since the Tuninga family has come off the field. They need more workers. We need to pray that the Lord would raise up more workers and send them to Uganda. We need to pray that he would raise up workers everywhere, you know, the Lord doesn't really often do what, what He's promised He's going to do unless His people pray and trust in Him and take hold of those promises and look to Him for the fulfillment of those things. The effectual prayer of a righteous man, a woman, can accomplish much, okay? But we need to pray. So Jesus said, told them at that time when things were, were moving in a positive direction, pray for more workers if they needed it then, how much more do we need it? We need to pray. Now, Jesus also warned them to be on their, on their guard. He says, go, in verse 3, behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. You know, they were lambs. They were to have a Christ-like character. They were to be like Jesus. They were not to return insult for insult, but they were basically to take whatever they might dish out against them. You see, they were to be like lambs, but the same thing wouldn't be true of their audience. 
Jesus says in Matthew 10, verses 17 and 18, But beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues, and you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. You know, we might sometimes think that in the days of Jesus it might have been safe to be a Christian and the audience was more receptive. This is what Jesus said they could expect. Well, sometimes we don't want to share the gospel because of what we think we're going to get as we, you know, share it with people who are hostile, right? Well, it's not any worse than it was for them. So we need to, you know, we just need to be, count the cost and be willing to do this. Now, we have been noting recently what an unbeliever's heart is actually like. You know, it, it's, it's not one that loves the Lord. It's one that could theoretically or, or potentially be hostile towards us. We need to expect that people will treat us in the way they treated Jesus. As a matter of fact, the more we're like him, the more likely it is that we're going to be treated like him. But Jesus is telling us here, we need to be willing to endure whatever we must for his sake, even as he endured what he endured for our sake and for the sake of all of his sheep. This is really the only way that anyone is ultimately going to be saved, right? Is by being willing to run the risk of, of reaching out to people who are hostile toward the gospel. You know, if they don't think they are when you start out, they may very well be by the time you end. I'm not saying everybody's going to get upset with you. That isn't the case. There will be people who are. And as a matter of fact, the people who get upset are the ones typically that are more affected by the gospel than the ones that don't or who are completely indifferent. But Jesus is, is warning them as he warns us, yes, people are like this, but we need to have a Christ-like character in response to them. Now, finally, and, and much of what he says here is really taken up in his directions to them, not to take any provisions, but to rely on those to whom they minister for the laborer is worthy of his wages. And we saw before that Jesus is basically saying, if you're going to devote yourself to this full time, then you should be supported by those to whom you minister. Now, that, that's the first point. The second point is this. As they went from town to town, they were to say, verse 9, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Now, as Jesus' ambassadors, they were to preach the gospel. That's what they were doing, not just to say the kingdom is near, okay, but as they're preaching the gospel, when they come, this is the way the kingdom comes near. As Jesus' ambassadors, they were charged by Jesus to offer God's terms of peace to them. I mean, they were at war with God, even though they were God's people. But they needed to lay down those weapons. They needed to repent, and they needed to trust in Jesus so that they might enter the kingdom of God of heaven. Basically, the kingdom was drawing near in the king, and the king was drawing near through the message that they were preaching, the message of the gospel. Now, as his ambassadors, we realize that we are also authorized to make this offer to those around us, to everyone, indiscriminately. And when we do, we're essentially doing the same thing that these disciples were doing uh, when they were heralding the gospel in Jesus' day. We're bringing the kingdom of God near to them, okay? They are far from the kingdom of heaven because they don't, they're in darkness and they don't have the truth, but we're bringing it near. We're bringing it near because Jesus or the king of the kingdom is drawing near to them in the gospel. That's how Jesus draws near. This is how he makes his offer of peace, of everlasting life. He does it through us. Jesus says in verse 16 of this text, the one who listens to you listens to me. So basically, Jesus is speaking through us. Now, that's why it's so important that, you know, we, we don't... Remember, we went through the apologetic series not too long ago, and we were looking at just one school of apologetics, which is the basically the creation science, right? We need to be careful that we don't just argue, you know, God exists. No, he does exist. God, you know, and just give him this proof. This is really pre-evangelism, let's not just do apologetics. We need to make sure we share the gospel because this is the way Jesus draws near, okay? The offer needs to be made. Now, it's interesting if you've ever done this, if you've ever gotten into an argument with someone, if you've ever tried to evangelize and 
you're sharing with that individual, and I'll tell you what, even if they happen to get worked up and even if they seem to be somewhat irritated with you, when you offer the gospel to them, something happens, something changes. It, it almost feels like the Lord suddenly is present and He is making that appeal. He is making that offer th through you. It's like He's standing right next to you, offering Himself to this individual. Now, that's why when we evangelize, as I've said, we do need to share the gospel. And when we do that, we'll find that even if we had to go through some hardship to do it, that we end up being more blessed that we did, that we did that, you see, than the one we're sharing with, especially if he doesn't receive the Lord. You know, it's, it's a blessing to be able to be persecuted for the sake of Christ, to take the abuse that's meant for Christ, even though we may not necessarily like the abuse in and of itself, it's still a blessing to receive that in the, in the name of Jesus, even as Paul said on one occasion that he bears in his body the brand marks of Christ, okay? He was talking about taking that abuse for him. That's a blessing. But when that appeal comes and the Lord works through you and he draws near to that individual, that is really a very special blessing as well and one that, that I hope we, we all have the opportunity to experience. Well, this is what the apostles, what, what Jesus, actually the disciples, the 70, Jesus called them to do, tell them the kingdom is near because you are representing the king and you're offering him, and he is making his appeal through you. Now, finally, Jesus tells them what to do if these people refuse to listen. They will not you know, receive the Lord Jesus. They will not receive the kingdom. He says they were to dust off of their feet, basically the dust of their feet, as a testimony against them. He says in verses 10 and 11, but whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your city which clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near. So basically, they weren't even to carry the soil of their streets away on their feet as they left to show them just how serious this rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ is and the certainty that the Lord would also reject them or wipe them off of his feet on the day of judgment if they didn't turn from their sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's a pretty severe image. And just how severe is it? Well, we're going to see here in just a moment. One thing we should note is this, that it may have been perhaps a little bit more severe for them because of who they were. Okay, we need to remember this is not breaking ground into the Gentile area. These are not people that are totally in darkness and just hearing for the first time. Okay, these are the old covenant people of God that they're evangelizing, right? They had privileges. They had information, okay? So they're already rejecting a great deal of light. And when they add to that the rejection of our Lord Jesus Christ, everything that the old covenant was pointing to, things become much severer, okay? Well, just how bad is it? Jesus tells them in verses 12 through 15, I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day, the day of judgment, for Sodom than for that city. And then he goes on to talk about similar situations that happened in other cities. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago. By the way, notice Jesus knows what would have happened if circumstances had been different. Okay, the Lord has infinite knowledge. They would have repented long ago sitting in sackcloth and ashes, but it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, this is where Jesus really spent most of his time. It's where Peter's house was, his mother-in-law, Capernaum, right? Where he did most of his miracles and Preach the gospel. You, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will be brought down to Hades. Now, think about the comparisons that are going on here. I mean, Sodom. God destroyed Sodom for their homosexuality, okay? For their attempted rape of two angels that they thought were, were men, okay? But judgment is going to be more tolerable Okay, more bearable for them in the day of judgment than for that city that rejects the gospel. 
God destroyed Tyre and Sidon for their idolatry, for their wickedness. They had many crimes, perhaps similar to Sodom, we don't know. And for that, the Lord basically condemned the city of Tyre literally to be scraped off the face of the earth and cast into the sea. And you know what it actually was? Alexander the Great took the city down, threw it into the ocean to build a causeway out to an island where the people of Tyre had fled. So that city literally was leveled and scraped off the ground and thrown into the sea. Okay, that's what happened to Tyre and Sidon. But judgment, Jesus said, is going to be more tolerable for them than for Chorazin and Bethsaida. By the way, do you notice there's a, there's a degree of punishment here on the day of judgment? If Jesus had done the same miracles in Tyre and Sidon that he did in Chorazin and Bethsaida, they would have repented. And the same thing again is true with regard to Capernaum. Now, they, the reason why things are going to be more severe for them is because they had a greater privilege. They had a greater advantage. They had more light. The Savior drew near to them. The kingdom of heaven had come near, and they rejected him. And in rejecting him, Jesus says they rejected his father as well. They, they rejected everything the old covenant was about, and they rejected the fulfillment of that covenant. Jesus says in verse 16, the one who listens to you listens to me, and the one who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. I'll tell you what, it's a great privilege, isn't it? to hear the gospel and to be able to share it with other people. But it's a great sin, having heard it, to reject it. Things will go much worse for them in the day of judgment if they don't repent and turn to the Lord Jesus. So this really raises an interesting question. Should we avoid sharing the gospel if we know that a large portion of the people we share it with are going to reject it and if they don't repent, they're going to have to face a severe judgment. Well, you know the answer to that question. Jesus tells us that we have to share the gospel, right? It alone is the power of God unto salvation. It is the way that God saves people. It's how the Lord draws near to save. We do need to think of what's going to happen to them if we don't share the gospel. Now, by the way, when Jesus says it's going to be more tolerable for one over the other, we shouldn't let that fact make us think that the judgment of those who don't hear the gospel but have committed wicked crimes is going to be in any way tolerable or bearable. It isn't. Okay, when Jesus said what he said, he's simply telling us that it's going to be worse, okay, for Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, and for everyone who rejects the gospel. It's going to be worse for them. It doesn't mean it's going to be bearable for anyone but it's going to be worse for these who had more knowledge. So again, degrees of punishment based upon opportunity, based upon knowledge, based upon what the Lord gives them, based upon what He doesn't give them. All of these things are basically weighed in the balances. And then punishment is meted out on the day of judgment. Those who have greater privilege and they reject it are going to suffer more, okay? Yes, there can be greater and lesser suffering in hell. The only way to escape suffering entirely is through the gospel, which is why Jesus commissioned the disciples in the first place to go and to preach the gospel. And that's why, of course, we need to do it as well. So this morning, in closing, let me just say two things. First of all, realizing judgment is severe for those who, who know the truth and reject it Let's make sure that we have received it. Let's make sure that we are repenting and trusting in Jesus, okay? There is salvation in no one else but Him. But let's also be reminded as His ambassadors that there are people out there who are in this situation, okay? People who are in darkness and they're going to perish in darkness unless we bring the light to them. People who have had the light brought to them but who have rejected it and who are going to face greater judgment unless they repent and turn to Christ. Let's not forget there is a process involved breaking ground, planting, watering in order to bring this to fruition. So let's be encouraged out of love for our Lord Jesus and also compassion for the lost to do all we can to get the word out to them 
to bring the kingdom near to them, to bring Jesus near to them, that they might escape that coming judgment as we have in the Lord Jesus. Well, let, let's bow, shall we, for a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to um, apply this to us as he would.